I'm going to talk about common emergency procedures. So this is kind of an outline of different procedures we're going to talk about. So I'll just go through each procedure, give you guys kind of an idea of how a patient might present that would need any of these procedures, and then go through the procedure itself, any complications, tips and tricks, things like that. So the first one is a thoracocentesis, which is a pretty common procedure that we do in the ER. So these radiographs, um, obviously we've got some pleural effusion and a pneumothorax um, respectively. So these would both be indications to perform a thoracocentesis if you see these on x-ray. So we're really looking at pleural space disease. Um, so clinical signs would be things like dull lung sounds, ventrally for pleural effusion or dorsally if we're talking about a pneumothorax. Usually the patients are also tachypnic or dyspneic. On diagnostics, we can see the radiographs like we saw previously. You can also use a thoracic ultrasound to see pleural fluid. Um, so your differentials for pleural effusion, you know, you can have your exudate like a pyothorax, to have a transudate like heart failure, chylus effusion, hemorrhagic effusion from trauma or something like that. For your pneumothorax, that's going to be most common after trauma, usually a blunt force trauma like being hit by a car. You can also have a spontaneous pneumothorax. We see that a lot of huskies. Um, we've also seen a case from heartworm disease have a spontaneous pneumothorax. So those are just some things to keep in mind. So again, those are the indications for performing a thoracocentesis if you see either of those things. There's no real contraindication to a thoracocentesis in a life-threatening situation. If the patient has a coagulopathy, it's kind of relative. If it's going to be life-saving, I would go ahead and do the procedure. But if it's only like a mild pleural effusion and you're worried about bleeding, may want to try and wait a little bit, but you can use that kind of at your discretion. So the materials that you would need for this procedure are listed there. Uh, we've also got a picture of kind of one of our setups. So um, obviously you need your sterile supplies and the type of catheter that you use depends really on doctor preference and patient size, uh, but definitely want to get an extension set, a three-way stopcock, syringes. Again, the size is going to vary based on your patient. Um, collection bowl and tubes. A catheter, IV catheter is nice. Sometimes you need sedation, sometimes you don't. You could also do a local block if you want. And usually these patients are clinical for their disease, so supplemental oxygen would be recommended. So if you're going to sedate your patient, go ahead and do that first. Um, flow by oxygen as needed. You can really place the patient in any position, so sternal recumbency. Um, I like to use for pleural effusion because the fluid will fall ventrally, or if it's a big dog, sometimes we'll do it standing. Um, if it's a pneumothorax, lateral recumbency can be helpful as well. So then you want to clip and prep the appropriate rib space. So um, if you don't have an ultrasound um, to guide kind of where you want to go, um, the landmarks are the seventh or eighth intercostal rib space for fluid, and you want to go ventrally for fluid or dorsally for air. And the landmarks for a pneumothorax would be the eighth or ninth intercostal space. And you want to go more dorsally if you're trying to get air, usually about a third of the way down the chest. Plus or minus a local block, I would say usually for thoracocentesis, we don't need to do a local block, but certainly if it's like a big dog with thick skin, you certainly can. Um, so then you put on your sterile gloves and then um, the technique can depend on, again, which kind of patient you're performing the procedure on. So for large dogs, um, I usually do an over the needle catheter, usually a one to one and a half inch. If it's like a fat dog, usually you need a longer needle. Um, 16 to 20 gauge, again, depending on the size of the dog. For cats and smaller dogs, um, a butterfly needle can certainly be used. Those are usually like 21 to 22 gauge. So if you're using the butterfly needle technique, you go ahead and attach the butterfly needle to your stopcock and syringe. Break the syringe seal by aspirating some air. Then you want to insert your needle perpendicular to the chest wall and cranial to the rib space. Um, to avoid the intercostal vessels. 
Um, once you um, are through the chest wall, you can direct the needle either dorsally if you're trying to get air or ventrally if you're trying to get fluid. Um, so you kind of want to leave the needle in the chest to where it's parallel to the chest wall so it's not just sticking straight in because um, then you could puncture the lungs. So once you're in there, you want to aspirate slowly and stop once you get negative pressure or if you get blood and you're not expecting to get blood or if you can feel the lung scratching against the needle, which sometimes you can. Um, you can also redirect the needle as needed for continuing to remove the fluid or the air. And then um, if you're still not getting anything, but you're seeing fluid remaining on your ultrasound, you can always kind of push some fluid back through the needle to dislodge any clots. So that's kind of a good tip and would be an argument for leaving the needle on the catheter. Um, Typically, once you get your sample of fluid, you want to save some back for fluid analysis, cytology, or culture. And then if you're getting air, you want to continue aspiration until you get negative pressure. So here's just some pictures of the butterfly technique. So this dog um, is in lateral recumbency. Looks like they're getting air off. And then on the other um, picture, they're getting some fluid off. And that's usually... Um, cats are small dogs for the butterflies. For the over the needle technique, um, the same principles apply when you're inserting the needle into the chest cavity. So um, you want to do the bevel up, cranial to the rib. Um, once you're in the chest space or the pleural space, you want to remove the stylet. And you can also advance the catheter off the stylet, just like you replace an IV catheter. So um, I prefer this. It's uh, obviously less traumatic if the lung hits uh, the tip of a catheter rather than a needle, but some of our ER doctors leave the needle on, so it's personal preference. Uh, once you remove the stylet, um, you can attach the catheter to the tubing, the three-way stopcock, and the syringe, and then aspirate as for um, the previous procedure. So complications, we can certainly see in iatrogenic pneumothorax. Usually if that occurs, it's pretty mild and not life-threatening. Um, you can certainly lacerate a lung. There can be hemorrhage. Um, if you're not using a sterile technique, you have the risk of infection. Um, and then re-expansion pulmonary edema is pretty rare to happen, um, but that could occur if there's chronic pleural effusion. And then certainly, you know, we, we don't want to stress the patient out too much by doing this procedure. So if it's like a very stressed cat, definitely use sedation beforehand. Next procedure we're gonna talk about is the pericardiocentesis. So if you take um, chest x-rays and you see a big globoid heart like that, you'd be concerned for pericardial effusion. And then the other picture is just a, an ultrasound image of pericardial effusion around the heart. So clinical signs, sometimes these dogs present for very vague signs. Sometimes they'll come in having collapsed, um, just being lethargic on their physical exam. Um, you may hear dull heart sounds. Um, they could be in shock, so low blood pressure, um, very dull tacky mucous membranes, things like that. Um, diagnostics, so radiographs can be suggestive of pericardial effusion. The echocardiogram would be your gold standard. Um, on your ECG, you can see electrical alternans, which is pictured there. So that's where you have the difference in the QRS sizes on ECG. Um, you can also run troponin levels if you're trying to determine if the a pericardial effusion is due to uh, neoplasia or not. And then your um, just basic CBC chemistry can help rule out some causes of pericardial effusion. So um, by far, you know, cancer is one of the more common reasons we see pericardial effusion. We also see idiopathic pericardial effusion in dogs. Um, in cats, heart failure is more likely to cause pericardial effusion than in dogs, um, but we can see like a left atrial rupture cause pericardial effusion in dogs. It's usually small little white breed dogs with mitral valve disease, coagulopathies, um, different types of infections, uremia, things like that. Um, so there's quite an extensive list, but usually cancer, idiopathic, or heart failure are the most common.
So an indication to perform pericardiocentesis, typically most cases where we see it will do the procedure, but definitely if a patient is in tamponade, um, so that's where they have hemodynamic compromise, so your ventricles can't fill because of the fluid around the heart, um, and that can result in cardiogenic shock. If you're just trying to get a sample of the fluid, you can certainly just perform the procedure for diagnostic purposes, but usually you're going to be doing it for therapeutic reasons. There's no real contraindication to pericardiocentesis, similar to a thoracocentesis. It's usually a life-saving procedure. Before the procedure, um, definitely for pericardiocentesis rather than a thoracocentesis, always want to have a catheter. You want to get baseline blood work, um, save some blood for a troponin level before the procedure, because after the procedure, the troponin level could be high just from the trauma of the procedure itself. Um, a lot of times these guys will need IV fluids either before or during the procedure because once you remove that fluid, their blood pressure can drop just because of the um, hemodynamic compromise that the patient um, has. And I always have my emergency drugs pulled up. So I'll have two milligrams per kilogram of lidocaine ready and kind of even on the tip of the catheter and have someone watch the ECG during the procedure, being ready to give that. Um, if you have an ultrasound, you want to confirm your effusion before tapping, and you want to have your patient on the ECG so you can look for things like VPCs. And I almost always sedate these guys unless, you know, it's like in the, the middle of an arrest or something. But um, usually just a little butorphanol is all you need. It depends on the case, so sometimes you might need a little more than that. So things you need are similar to for thoracocentesis. Um, things that would be a little different would be a scalpel blade and then the lidocaine. So we'll do the lidocaine for the emergency dose, like I just mentioned, and then also I do um, perform a local block for these procedures just because the needle is going further in. Um, so I usually drop two to four milligrams per kilogram in dogs. In cats, I lower dose due to neurotoxicity and then sedate the patient as well. So for this procedure, I typically do my pericardiocentesis in a left lateral recumbency. Um, our cardiologist will prefer sternal recumbency, so it just kind of depends on the doctor. Um, the left lateral would be preferred because the cardiac notch is on the right side, so that's going to minimize your risk of lung injury, and also your coronary vessels run along the left side of the heart, so there's less chance of lacerating um, when you're going in on the right side. If uh, the pet is in sternal, then um, you might want to go in from the right side as well. Um, you want to make sure your ECG is attached and everything is set up. And then you want to prepare the chest wall from the right third to the eighth intercostal space. Um, and then the local block I'll do, I'll kind of use my ultrasound to guide where I'm going to insert my needle and do the local block kind of clockwise around where my needle will go. And then I usually do a little kind of into the chest cavity as well. And then the catheter that you're going to use for this procedure, I use an over the needle catheter. And we have um, pretty large or like 14 to 16 gauge, five and a half inch catheters. So uh, Myla makes one or um, there's other companies as well. So if you don't have one that has holes through it, you can fenestrate a catheter if you want. That just helps the fluid come out quicker. Um, you can also use, like, like I said, the Myla has a commercial one already made. So once you're all prepared, um, you're going to make a stab incision with a scalpel blade through the skin. Um, and this really helps because a lot of these catheters are really hard to um, kind of insert all the way into the pericardium. They'll kind of shred on the end. So I like to just do a stab incision with my scalpel blade to help guide the catheter in. And then similar to the thoracocentesis, you want to go perpendicular to the skin, cranial to the rib. I usually advance pretty slowly, like in one centimeter increments until you see fluid. You typically, I always tell the interns, you have to go further in than you think. Um, and then another thing, if you don't have ultrasound guidance, you can kind of aim for the opposite shoulder. 
So if you're coming in from the right side, you want to aim towards the left shoulder. That's kind of the direction you want the needle to go in. So once you're in the pericardial space, feed the catheter a little bit more and then remove the stylet, attach your um, extension set and things like that. So while you're going in, it's important to have an assistant monitor the ECG because if you do puncture the heart, um, you're gonna see some VPCs. So that's where your emergency lidocaine comes in. If you do see VPCs as you're advancing your catheter, obviously you wanna pull out um, not totally, just back up a little bit, and then you can usually go back again in a minute. Um, once you get the fluid, I, I usually save a little bit right at the beginning to make sure it doesn't clot. Um, so if it is clotting, then you probably hit a ventricle, so that's not good. So if your blood's not clotting, that's a good sign. You can continue the procedure and then save your samples for cytology and culture. So for pericardiocentesis, you want to remove as much fluid as possible. Same thing for thoracocentesis. When we talk about abdominocentesis, you don't necessarily always need to remove all the fluid, but certainly for anything in the chest cavity, get as much out as you can. So this is one of the longer over-the-needle catheters like I was talking about. So you can see it's a pretty long catheter, and they're probably going to have to go at least halfway in with that one. It looks like that dog's a little overweight as well so it's often helpful to have an assistant kind of pull the skin up so that your the skin is taut when you're going in it's not kind of sagging over your catheter like that is and then obviously you're going to expect blood so wouldn't be surprised by that um, when you do get blood out so complications we kind of touched on already vpcs is going to be the major thing to look for i would say there's almost always vpcs when we do pericardiocentesis, it's usually just mild, um, and we kind of back the catheter out like we talked about. You could lacerate a coronary artery, um, you could lacerate a lung, or um, there could be hemorrhage, things like that. You could rupture a tumor if it's present. So um, there are certainly a lot of complications, but that being said, it's relatively safe. Um, so I certainly wouldn't be afraid to, to do the procedure because you know, a lot of these cases, if you don't do it, the patient's not going to make it. So um, I would say it's pretty safe overall. Once um, the procedure is done, we will typically hospitalize these patients overnight for monitoring on a continuous ECG. And we do that mostly just to see if the fluid reaccumulates quickly. Um, so overnight on the ECG, we have our technicians look for arrhythmias, a tachycardia, or the electrical alternands. I'm going to keep an eye on their blood pressure overnight as well as just their normal vital signs. Um, and then I'll usually start them on unum bial and amino caprylic acid to prevent or slow bleeding. Um, not sure that there's a lot of evidence that either of those will help, um, but it makes us feel better. So we usually um, will send the patients home, at least on the unum bial, um, kind of indefinitely. Okay, the next procedure is an abdominocentesis. So here's some images. Um, obviously that top radiograph, there's a lot of peritoneal effusion there. The other images, um, the FF would be free fluid. So you've got some free fluid around the bladder in one image and around the liver lobe um, in another image. You know, clinical signs of abdominal effusion, distended abdomen. Uh, sometimes these patients also come in for collapse, lethargy, vague clinical signs. On physical exam, you may find a fluid wave. They may have pale gums. They may, um, you know, have weak pulses or low blood pressure, things like that. Um, your diagnostics, your x-rays are pretty insensitive. Um, ultrasound would be preferred. And then just like with your pleural effusion, you can have exudates. So a septic abdomen would be an exudate, a transudate, so from uh, congestive heart failure, can have hemorrhage from a ruptured splenic mass. I'd say that's probably our most common reason that we see abdominal effusions in our hospital. Um, so a reason to take a sample of the abdominal fluid would be for diagnostic evaluation. I would say that's the most common thing that we do. In cases where there's chronic ascites, um, we'll sometimes remove that in larger quantities if it's resulting in hemodynamic or respiratory compromise in the patients. So these are usually like right-sided heart failure patients or chronic liver failure or something like that. 
And again, you know, the real contraindication would be a coagulopathy, but um, for the most part, there's not really any reason to not sample fluid if you see it in the abdomen. So your materials are going to be the same as the other procedures. Get some tubes for collection. Um, and then if you're going to remove a large volume, set up your extension set, just like for the thoracocentesis. If you have an ultrasound to guide you, um, that would be ideal, but you don't necessarily have to have one. So for this procedure, the patient can really be in any position, lateral recumbency, sternal recumbency, or standing. Um, you want to clip and prep the ventral abdomen. So if you have the ultrasound, that's super helpful to guide where your needle needs to go. Um, if you don't have an ultrasound, you can try just a, a blind poke cranial or caudal to the umbilicus, um, usually about two centimeters to the right of midline. So you can do that either with a closed technique. So if you have a needle attached to the syringe, um, and then you pull back on the plunger once you're in there to see if you get any fluid. Or I've also seen people use an open technique, so they just attach the needle, um, or they use the unattached needle, go up in the abdomen, and then they wait to see if fluid drips out. Um, so that's if you don't have an ultrasound. If you're not getting fluid, you can kind of twist the needle around and redirect it. Um, if you're patient has a small amount of fluid and you can't get a sample, you could try a four quadrant tap. So that would be four open needles, um, kind of one in each quadrant. So cranial, caudal on the right and the left respectively. And then once you get your fluid, you want to save the samples for analysis and kind of do your diagnostic evaluation to determine what type of fluid it is and then develop a treatment plan for the patient. So this picture would be just kind of demonstrating where you would go with the four quadrant tap. And then here's another picture of someone with the dog standing. So um, usually for these, it's easier if the dog's standing, because obviously if they're laying on the side, it's not going to drip out of the top circle. So standing would be preferred for that. If you really can't get any fluid, you could certainly try a diagnostic peritoneal lavage. It's pretty much a last resort, um, but there's a lot of contraindications. I personally have not done this. I did see it done, I think, once in vet school, but um, there can be some complications. So you could rupture the bladder. Um, you could have the omentum obstruct your catheter, things like that. Um, but basically, this would be where you insert um, a really large catheter into the abdomen. And then if you're not getting fluid, you instill 20 mils per kg of warm water through the catheter. Um, clamp it off and let it sit in the abdomen and kind of roll the patient around and then pull the fluid back. Uh, when you do that, obviously, you're going to have to dilute um, or kind of spin down your sample because it will be diluted with the fluid. Um, so really rare to have to do this, but um, certainly is something that you could consider if you just can't get that fluid. So once you get the fluid, like I said, you can analyze it to help kind of determine what the cause of the abdominal fluid is. So you can look at the cell types, um, protein levels. Um, for like a septic abdomen, we would compare the fluid, blood glucose and lactate to the blood glucose and the lactate of the patient. If you're looking at potentially a hemoabdomen, you would compare the PCV of the patient to the PCV of the fluid. If you're looking for a uroabdomen, you would compare the potassium and the creatinine of the patient to the fluid. And then for bile peritonitis, like a ruptured mucus seal, you can look at the bilirubin of the fluid as compared to the bilirubin of the patient. So we're gonna move on from the synthesis portion. And now we're gonna talk about placing chest tubes. Um, so there's some pictures there. This would be a surgically placed chest tube, um, but we'll talk about different chest tube placements. So. Um, the reason to place a chest tube would be if you have a patient who needs very frequent um, evacuation of their pleural space, so like in a spontaneous pneumothorax or a pneumothorax hit by car where the patient needs to be tapped, you know, every couple of hours, going ahead and placing a chest tube um, is much more efficient for the nurses. It's better for the patient. They don't have to be poked every few hours. Um, another indication would be like a pyothorax, 
Um, so we really need to get all that infectious fluid out of the chest. If you have a tension pneumothorax, so if you have a pneumothorax where you're pulling air and pulling air and pulling air and you still can't get to negative pressure, that would be a time to place a chest tube. Um, and then any sort of thoracotomy patient uh, that's coming out of the OR, our surgeons will put a chest tube in. It's just nice to have. Most of the time we don't need it, but um, if anything were to happen overnight, we have the ability to evacuate the chest cavity right away. So similar to um, our other procedures, the only real contraindication would be a severe coagulopathy, but again, that's going to be relative because a lot of times this is a life-saving procedure. So the materials needed are pretty similar to um, the thoracocentesis, except obviously you're going to need your chest tube. So we'll talk about different ways to do that. And then um, kind of your, how you're going to secure your chest tube. So this picture here is of a, a low profile Mila chest tube kit. So those are all the things that come in the kit. So depending on if you're using that versus if you're using like a larger bore chest tube, different ways to secure it um, depending on the product that you're using. So for the non-invasive surgical method, this would be where you're using kind of a larger bore chest tube, but it's not necessarily the low profile and you're not placing it in surgery. So um, typically these patients will need to be sedated or fully anesthetized and then you place the patient in lateral recumbency and then you want to kind of prep the lateral thorax. Usually do a local block for these cases because it is a larger bore um, catheter going into their chest and then you want to make a small incision over the widest point of the thorax. So usually at the ninth to tenth intercostal space and you wanna have an assistant stretch the skin cranially, so you're gonna create a tunnel um, that allows the chest tube to be placed um, usually between the seventh and eighth intercostal spaces where you're gonna aim. Once you kind of get in position, you wanna bluntly dissect into the pleural space with hemostats, and then you kind of spread your hemostats open and then pass the chest tube um, through the hole that you created. So once the chest tube is into the pleural space, you want to advance it cranially and ventrally uh, while the tube is held kind of parallel to the chest wall. And then once that's in place, you feed the stylet off in the same direction. If the patient is under anesthesia, you want to stop breathing for them while the tube goes into the chest cavity. And then once you're in there, go ahead and connect it to your stopcock and then um, continuous drainage or whatever you're connecting it to and then aspirate your air or your fluid from the tube. Um, for this, we usually secure the chest tube to the skin with a purse string suture, kind of around the entry site, and then a finger trap after that. And then we do cover our chest tubes with a light bandage, and then um, always confirm placement with um, chest x-rays, and you want two views of those. Another method is the trocar method, and this one is a little more risky as far as uh, rate of trauma from the procedure. So it's not recommended in cats because their chest wall is pretty friable anyway. And for this one, you definitely want to anesthetize the patient. So it's similar to the previous procedure. Um, so you're going to tunnel up two to three rib spaces cranially and then you position the tube kind of perpendicular to the chest wall and then hold the tube like in a tight fist um, where there's only about one to two inches of the tube um, that could penetrate the chest and then you kind of pop the tube uh, with your other fist into the chest cavity so you really have to get a good grip down at the bottom so that you don't pop the whole tube through the chest. And so that's where the tricky part comes in. Once you're into the chest cavity, you kind of lower it um, at an angle and then slide it forward just, just like the previous procedure. So you slide it off of the stylet cranially and ventrally and then connect it um, just like in the previous um, tube placement. Just to give you guys an idea, see he's holding down here near the body wall so that only one to two inches would come into the chest cavity and he's holding the other end up here. Then once he's through into the pleural space, he's going to advance it cranial and ventrally um, into the chest cavity.
So what I do more commonly, since I'm not a surgeon, is the low profile chest tubes, um, and they use the Seldinger technique. So similar to placing a central venous catheter. So for these cases, you really only need some light sedation, if any, and it's no more invasive than doing a thoracocentesis. You kind of clip and scrub, drape, just like for the traditional chest tube placement. You can use a local block if um, needed, but you don't always need it. And um, with this, the catheter kit comes with an introducer catheter. So you kind of enter the chest cavity just as you would for a thoracocentesis. So right around the seventh to eighth intercostal space. Once you're in the pleural cavity, you remove the stylet on the introducer catheter, and then you feed the J wire through the catheter into the pleural space. Once the wire is in there, then you have to hold on to the wire where the chest cavity, uh, where the skin and the chest cavity meet, and then you remove the introducer catheter. So you're holding on to the wire now. There's no catheter in the chest cavity. And then there's a dilator that you um, use to kind of dilate the skin around there. So you dilate that, then you remove the dilator, and then you place the longer Mila catheter over the wire and into the pleural space. So these catheters are fenestrated, so they'll allow more fluid to exit. And once the Mila catheter is in place, then you remove the wire. So the Mila catheter is the part that's gonna be left in the chest cavity. And then it's got um, little places where you secure it to the skin, uh, little hubs. So you kind of just suture through the holes. And then again, you wanna confirm your placement with your chest x-rays. So this is kind of what it looks like. So there's the wire I was talking about. So it can get a little tricky because the wire is coiled up and sometimes it can kind of flail about. So you have to have a steady hand or an assistant who's also wearing sterile gloves kind of help you. Um, but in this picture here, they're basically inserting the Myla catheter over the wire. And when it's secured, it looks like this. So these are the hubs I was talking about. So there will be some exiting so usually the whole catheter is not in there but you just kind of suture it here and then uh, once it's secure we do usually cover those with a bandage as well so these catheters are great for like a transudate fluid we use them a lot for pneumothorax because obviously air can come through there if you have a pyothorax where it's a thick exudative fluid these catheters may not be big enough and that's where the larger bore chest tubes we would use those instead so um, some complications, just like with thoracocentesis, you can get pneumothorax, you can see some hemorrhage. Sometimes you can get some subcutaneous edema if you're feeding the chest tube through the subcutaneous space instead of the pleural cavity, which is a pretty common mistake. And obviously for the trocar method, the complications can be um, a little more involved, like impaling the heart or the lung. So, we try not to do that one if possible. So once you have a chest tube in place, you really should be, have the ability to monitor the patient for 24 hours, like constant monitoring. Um, the tubes can be aspirated intermittently. So sometimes we'll start out aspirating them every one to two hours. And then if we're not getting very much fluid or air, then we'll kind of back it down to every four to six. Um, or you can also connect them to a continuous suction. Um, so it just kind of depends on the patient and what you're trying to aspirate. When you're not using it, the tube, it should be clamped at all times and um, kind of capped off. So this is where training your nurses properly will be key. Uh, whenever they're messing with the tube, they should be sterile. So at least wearing gloves. And then um, the insertion site should be checked daily. So if there is a bandage over it, you want to remove the bandage, evaluate the site. Um, if the tube seems to not be working, definitely check for loose connections. Retake your x-rays, see if the tube migrated, if it's kinked. Um, there's all sorts of little things like that that can come up. And then typically we'll leave the tube in place until there's less than two to four mils per kg per day of fluid. Um, and then if you're using the larger bore chest tubes, those can be pretty painful. So we definitely want to keep those patients on pain medications. For the lower profile tubes, I don't think they're as painful. Um, so that would be kind of as needed. So here's a picture. Um, this chest tube was probably placed intraoperatively, but it's got a net covering there. And it looks like we've got some blood exiting. 
Um, here's some pictures of the continuous drainage systems. This device here, a Pleurovac, is what we use for like a spontaneous pneumothorax. Um, you could make your own technically with one of these systems. Um, but basically, we have three different bottles or three different chambers. So one can collect fluid. Um, so you basically connect it to the patient's chest tube. And then there's a wa underwater seal. So you have air that can exit the pleural space. So when we're leaving these on for a pneumothorax, we always check to make sure the system is bubbling. So that means we are continuing to remove air. Um, it's obviously, you can't quantify how much air you're getting out because it's continuously sucking the air, but it is helpful for those cases where, you know, you would have to aspirate it hourly or something like that. So now we're going to move on to a temporary tracheostomy tube placement. So here's some pictures of that. Indications for this would be um, life-threatening upper airway obstructions, see this commonly in our brachycephalic friends. Um, you can see like if the pet has a foreign body lodged in its trachea or laryngeal paralysis or a big mass on its larynx. Um, any sort of thing that could cause an upper airway obstruction that we might need to bypass, this would be a good um, indication for this procedure. Similar to the other procedures we've talked about so far, there's no absolute contraindications. There's a lot of things relatively that you might say, maybe we shouldn't do this, but in a life-threatening situation, those would kind of be out the door. But anything like recent neck surgery, increased intracranial pressure, all of those things may not be the best um, candidate for this procedure. So we talk about choosing a tracheostomy tube. There's a lot of different types out there. There are cuffed or uncuffed, uncuffed tubes. They can have single or double cannulas. Um, most of them contain some sort of tie to secure it in place. Uh, if you also don't have any of the commercial your, uh, tracheostomy tubes, you can make one on your own, which we've had to do before for like really small cases. But um, here's a picture here. So you can kind of cut the endotracheal tube um, like so and attach some umbilical tape to tie it in place. Um, the size that you want to choose, you want it to be a half to a third the width of the tracheal diameter. So you want air to be able to flow through and around the tube if it's uncuffed. Um, the length should be about six to seven tracheal rings down from wherever you place it. Materials you would need, a tracheostomy tube. Um, if you can intubate the patient, an endotracheal tube, but you may not always be able to. Um, just your standard. Um, anesthesia supplies, clippers, scrubs, serial gloves, surgery pack. Usually these patients need supplemental oxygen and then suction as well. So for the procedure itself, um, they want to place the patient in dorsal recumbency with their neck extended um, and their thoracic limbs extended caudally. Um, if you can, place a rolled towel under the neck. It's nice. A lot of times in an emergency setting, we don't have time to do that. Um, you want to shave and prep the neck, uh, basically from the mandle to the manubrium, and then laterally past the jugular vein. So it's a pretty wide shave. You want to make your incision on the ventral midline from just caudal to the larynx, down about three to four centimeters. And then um, if you have a retractor, that's helpful to hold the skin edges open and identify your muscles. Then you're going to use Metzenbaum scissors to separate the muscles and expose the trachea. And there are some important veins there, so you want to try and avoid those if you can. Once you're down to the trachea, you want to use a scalpel blade to incise um, the ligament um, horizontally. There are some people who prefer um, a vertical incision, but I've always done the horizontal. I find it to be easier and you wanna go between the second and third tracheal rings. And you wanna make sure your incision does not extend uh, beyond 50% of the tracheal circumference. Once you've made your incision, then you wanna place stay sutures around the second and third tracheal rings, and then tag them with mosquito forceps. And then you use the forceps to open the trachea. And then that's when you're gonna insert your trachea tube, or your tracheostomy tube. Once your tube is in place, um, you want to go ahead and attach the umbilical tape to the little eyelets and then tie the tape behind the neck. 
Um, typically, we don't suture these wounds unless the incision is just really large. We usually leave them open to heal. And then on our stay sutures, where the mosquito um, forceps were, we'll usually put tape and label them up and down so that if we need to replace the tracheostomy tube while the patient's in the hospital, we can quickly grab those and know which way to pull so that the tracheostomy tube site will open right up for us. So some complications, obviously hemorrhage, you can cause damage to the recurrent laryngeal nerve, which is right around in there. If the patient's already intubated, um, sometimes you might um, hit the endotracheal tube cuff and you could cause an obstruction. If the tube gets clogged, the tube could become dislodged. They like to get infected so they can get pneumonia. Obviously, there's a, a much bigger hole going right into the lungs, so that's more of a risk for infection. Um, there can be subcutaneous emphysema or you can cause injury to the trachea itself. We've got an English bulldog and a pug, both poster childs for this procedure. So those are just an example of the top and bottom or up and down stay sutures so that uh, whenever we're cleaning the tube or if we need to remove it, like if it becomes clogged, we can just pop a new one right in. Um, and then this is a, just someone humidifying his tracheostomy tube site. Uh, a lot of times these dogs have a lot of skin folds over their neck. So it's kind of hard to keep clean, um, but it's tied kind of around the back of his head there, which is a little hard to see. Once these uh, tubes are in, again, similar to leaving a chest tube in place, you're gonna want to have 24 seven monitoring for these patients. You wanna always keep a second tube the same size near the cage in case it needs to be replaced if the other one becomes clogged. Um, typically we perform our tracheostomy tube care every four hours. Sometimes if the patient has a lot of secretions, we may need to do it more frequently than that. And typically what we'll do, if the tube has an inner cannula, we'll um, take that out, clean it, and replace it. We'll typically humidify the airway for about 20 minutes before we do any of this, and then we suction the trachea with a sterile suction catheter and then leave them on 100% oxygen for a few minutes after the procedure. Um, you want to clean around the incision site um, and then to ensure that the tube is secured into place. So anytime they're doing these um, procedures around the tube, they're always wearing sterile gloves too. The tube itself should be replaced usually at least every 24 hours if there's no inner cannula. If it has the inner cannula, that's nice because you can just take that out let it soak in dilute chlorhexidine and pop it back in. But if there's no cannula, then you really just need to replace the tube because they get very gross with all the secretions. Tube removal can occur basically as soon as the patient doesn't need it to breathe on their own. Um, so sometimes I've seen doctors kind of, if you start out with like a six French tube, maybe they'll try putting a four French tube in if the patient's doing fine with that, then they'll take it out. I usually just remove it and see how they do. Um, obviously, this is where you wanna have another one available in case you need to put it back in. Um, and like I said earlier, the wound is left open to heal by second intention. Typically, once the tracheostomy tube is out, we'll clean the site daily with sterile saline. And then obviously, we gotta tell the owners they can't bathe their dog, swim, wear neck leads or collars until that site heals. So the next thing we'll talk about is uh, nasal oxygen catheters. So here's a picture of a lovely Labrador with a nasal oxygen catheter. Um, so this is a great way to supplement oxygen in tachypneic or dyspneic dogs. Um, typically this would be for large dogs who can't fit into the oxygen cage or if you don't have oxygen cages, um, but you have um, you know, oxygen hookups. The nasal catheters can be helpful. Um, it's very cheap. They're quick, easy to place. You can also kind of move around the patient and examine them. Whereas, you know, if they're in an oxygen cage, you get the doors open, they're losing oxygen. It's harder to look at the patient. And then you can provide a pretty high um, fraction of inspired oxygen with a relatively low oxygen flow rates. Some reasons you wouldn't want to place a nasal oxygen catheter if you have any sort of rhinitis, epistaxis, or nasal tumors or fractures. Complications are pretty rare. If you're using very high oxygen flow rates, you can get damage to the nasopharyngeal mucosa, 
Um, so typically if you're using a high flow rate, you want to humidify your oxygen source. Um, you can see some gastric distension if you're using high rates. Um, sometimes you'll get nasal discharge or epistaxis just from the trauma of placing the catheter. So the materials that you need, you would need an oxygen source, obviously. Um, typically, you want a regulator on there, so a flow meter, so you know how much flow you're providing to the patient. Um, also, a bubble humidifier is helpful because you want to humidify that air is going in there. You want your oxygen tubing. Um, we typically just use a red rubber catheter, or you could use an infant feeding tube. You also want some sterile lubricant. We just use the Proparacane eye drops to numb the nose. Uh, you want some tape, suture, and an e-collar. Um, so this chart here is just kind of a guide for what size tube you might want to try, depending on the size of your patient. Obviously, you know, some large dogs have small nares and vice versa. So kind of just look at the dog's nares and decide what you think might fit. And you may have to try a couple different sizes. So once you've selected your tube size, um, to the medial or lateral canthus um, of the eye. Um, and then towards, um, you wanna mark the tube kind of right where you want it to end. And then have your assistant restrain the pet, usually from behind, and you wanna aim the patient's nose towards the ceiling. Then we'll put um, the Proparacane drops into the nostrils and then lube the tube so it goes in a little easier for your dogs. Um, you want to insert the catheter in the dorsal medial direction and then ventral medially. And then in cats, you want to go ventral and medial. And you want to insert it just a little bit at a time until you get to your pre marked level. Once your tube is in place, um, you can suture it to the side of the patient's muzzle or kind of as close to the nasal planum as you can get. And then there's a couple different options once the catheter's in place as far as where to secure it. So you can secure it on the side of the face, which is what we'll typically do. Sometimes people will do it up the bridge of their nose or on their forehead. However, you can get it to stay in place. Um, so a combination of tape, suture, skin staples. Um, and then once you're um, secured into place, you can hook it up to your oxygen tubing and make sure the patient wears an e-collar because they're definitely going to paw at it and try and get it out. So that's the nasal oxygen catheter. Um, now we're going to move on to um, placing urethral catheters. So there's um, several different sections to this, male, female, um, canine, and feline, but here's our poster child is a blocked kitty um, with his hemorrhagic urine there looking pretty sad. Obviously, a common emergency would be a blocked kitty straining to urinate or defecate in and out of the litter box. They've got a large firm bladder that you can't express urine. Um, so minimally diagnostics, a renal panel, including electrolytes, urinalysis, and a lateral abdominal film. Um, once you get the catheter in place to screen for stones. Um, ideally, a CBC, a urine culture would be nice, but if we're trying to save money, um, would be lower on the list of things that we would like. So obviously the indication would be if a patient's fully obstructed, we want to alleviate that. Sometimes we'll pass a, urine, a urethral catheter just to empty the bladder. Um, sometimes we'll pass one to monitor urine output, like in cases of acute kidney injury or toxin or something like that. Or if you need to obtain a sample for a procedure or something like that um, would be another indication. There's really no contraindication to placing a urethral catheter. So there's several different types. Um, you've got your red rubber, your Tomcat. The Tomcat itself could be either open-ended or closed. Um, we've got slippery SAMs or the Foley catheters, um, which would be ideal for indwelling use. There's all, also very different sizes depending on the patient. So for cats, we're looking at three and a half to five French. Um, and then medium large weak dogs up to 10 French um, Foley's. And then the length of your catheter should extend um, into the tip of the bladder at the trigone. For your closed collection system, so once your catheter is in place, um, a closed collection system would be preferred. Um, so that's going to facilitate emptying of the urine from the bag without disconnecting it from the catheter. So there's just less, less open to the air, less infection. Um, it's also going to prevent retrograde flow of the urine from the bag 
back into the bladder, which I've definitely seen happen. Open collection systems are not ideal just because once the bag's full, you have to disconnect it to empty it. Um, and the least preferred would be leaving the catheter open to the environment and just letting it drip because we can see ascending infections that way. Um, there's one study where about 20 of the 36 cats developed a urinary tract infection. So the least recommended of all those techniques. The risk of infection with catheterization varies depending on what study you read and if it's a dog or a cat, male, female, um, but anywhere from 10 to 52% of patients, the longer the catheter is in, um, the more risk of infection. And the main thing in most of these studies looking at risk of infection was if you have a sterile technique, the risk is pretty minimal. Um, so actually for humans, the CDC does not recommend using systemic antibiotics just prophylactically to prevent catheter-associated urinary tract infections. Um, so we typically don't keep them on antibiotics unless they have a UTI already based on our, you know, um, workup initially. For our male cats, um, definitely before we catheterize them, we want to check their blood work. If they're hyperkalemic, we want to correct that. Now, if the kitties die, obviously we're going to have to unblock them sooner, but if they're relatively stable and they're hyperkalemic, we'll correct that. So typically we'll do calcium gluconate. And the dose that I use is three mils diluted one-to-one -one with saline, and that's of the 20% calcium gluconate. Um, and you want to make sure that they're hooked up to an ECG when you give that because it can cause some arrhythmias. Um, we'll also do, we'll check a BG first. As long as they're not um, hyperglycemic, we'll do a dextrose bolus to help drive the potassium into the cells. Sometimes we'll give insulin as well, but if you do give insulin um, for the same reason, to drive the potassium into the cells, wanna make sure you recheck the blood sugar after giving the insulin. They may need more dextrose. Uh, you can also give a bronchodilator, so like terbutaline will also help drive potassium into the cells. Um, so those are some things to do um, kind of beforehand. Um, sedation protocols, there's a wide range of things that you could use. Uh, we've definitely seen lots of cats that don't even need sedation. They're so um, compromised, but most of the time they will need a little something. So we'll typically do either a pure mu opioid or buprenorphine along with like midazolam ketamine or an opioid dextomator. Um, we've been using a lot of alfaxalone lately in cats. Um, propofol titration is not ideal, so we'll typically do one of the first three here rather than the propofol titration. Um, we could also try a coccygeal block as well, which is kind of a newer uh, reported pain control. So that um, would be kind of like a tail block. So you place the patient in ventral recumbency and prep their sacral coccygeal region. Then you palpate the space between their sacrum and the first coccygeal vertebrae. Um, and then kind of you kind of crank the tail up and down to kind of feel where that spot is and then you insert your needle typically at a 30 to 45 degree angle at the midline of that space and then when you advance the needle you're going to feel a pop just like with any epidural and then um, you know you kind of reach the, the spot that you want to be in and then you want to make sure you're getting negative pressure and then infuse typically we'll use preservative free lidocaine for these and they can work pretty well. Um, so some reasons that you might not want to do a coccygeal block would be, you know, if the patient is already septic, if they've got really bad skin, um, or if they're severely compromised, I would usually just skip this and go straight to the unblocking. We have these UO kits that we have kind of at the ready because we do them so much, but um, here's a list of things that you might want to have in your kit. So obviously all your sterile supplies, your laceration pack, your urinary catheters, I believe in our packs we have a variety of sizes and types. You wanna have sterile saline to flush, you wanna have your urinary catheter line and your collection system. So first you wanna sedate the patient and then once they're nice and sedate, place them in dorsal recumbency. Um, you can draw their hind limbs granularly toward their head um, to kinda of help facilitate placement. Then you wanna clip and prep the prepuce and then um, determine which length of catheter you might need. 
get all your sterile gloves and everything ready and then extrude the penis. Um, a lot of times you'll find grit or plug on the tip of the penis. Sometimes it will be purple. Um, there's no telling what you'll find there. So once you do that, then um, you can kind of flush that area and then prep it. And then whichever catheter you select, you want to be sure and place a lot of sterile lube on it and then attempt to pass the catheter. So I'll typically try with a red rubber or slippery sand first. It almost never works and you have to go to the Tomcat, but obviously the Tomcat's a little more rigid. Um, so some tips, you can extend the penis caudally to facilitate the catheter advancement. Um, so that's going to kind of straighten the urethral flexure. Um, I often have an assistant kind of flush the catheter as you attempt to pass it. You can kind of move the catheter up and down in very small increments, twist it around. Um, sometimes it goes right in, sometimes there's some resistance met. Um, if you do use a Tomcat initially, once you've relieved the obstruction, um, we'll always replace it with a red rubber or slippery sand just because they are so rigid, leaving them in place for a long period of time can cause a lot of trauma to the urethra. So we'll um, replace those as soon as the obstruction is relieved. Um, so retropulsion, uh, we have to do, I would say, in most cases of um, blocking cats. So that's where you're going to flush saline into the bladder um, as you attempt to pass the catheter. Uh, so for this, you want to be sure and occlude the tip of the penis around the catheter so that you don't have flush flowing back out. And then you want to make sure you're not flushing too much in because you don't want to over distend the bladder. Um, you can also have an assistant occlude the urethra, so if they place a gloved finger in the rectum um, for males um, or in the vagina for females and they push down on the pelvic floor, um, then you have either yourself or someone else flushes some saline through, um, then they should be able to feel the urethra dilate. So once that urethra does dilate, they can pull their finger off real quick and that can sometimes help the calculi or whatever is causing the obstruction go back into the bladder. So sometimes we'll try that. Um, if you're still not getting the patient unblocked, a lot of times we'll have to fully anesthetize them and then try again. Once you have the obstruction relieved, you want to secure the catheter in place. Um, so the slippery SAM catheters are nice because they suture directly to the prepuce. So they've got holes all the way around them so that you can just suture it right there. Um, if you're using a red rubber, I usually do like a butterfly tape and then um, so use stay sutures and kind of secure it that way. Um, once the catheter is in place, then we usually always secure it to the tail with tape. Um, so we'll kind of leave a bit, of, a bit of slack in case the cat lifts his tail up, um, but we'll wrap tape all the way around the tail just so it's kind of an extra way to secure it. Um, you want to save your sample prior to flushing the bladder to look for bacteria, crystals, things like that. Um, so we typically will flush our bladders. I guess if the urine is not too gritty or cloudy, you know, the flushing could cause more irritation than benefit. Um, so you may not want to flush, you know, five or six times, but you could at least flush it out a little bit and then attach your closed collection system. And then once you're done with that, obtain a lateral x-ray just to make sure your catheter's in the right spot and then look for any stones or anything like that. So here's a picture of the catheter secured into place. So this would be a slippery SAM. So there's, you can't really see the hole there, but they're going through a hole. So I think there's three or four. Um, so you suture that in place. And then this would be, the red rubber butterfly tape. And this can get very complicated with the suture and things like that, but it, it does work to suture it in place. So you don't, have, if you don't have a slippery sand, that's no problem. Some complications, obviously you can cause damage to the urethra. You can rupture the urethra. I've seen that happen several times. Um, you can cause a stricture. You could rupture the bladder, especially if you over distend it with flush. Um, things like that for uh, post-obstructive uh, management. So there's a lot of controversy and a lot of papers have been written up about how long to leave the catheter in place, medications, things like that. I'll say we typically leave our urinary catheters in, um, at least for blocked cats, for about 36 to 48 hours. 
um, depending on several factors. So is, has the azotemia resolved? If not, we'll leave the urinary catheter in place until the patient's no longer azotemic. Is the urine still really bloody and gross? If it is, we'll leave it in a day longer. So it kind of depends. Um, most studies recommend at least 24 hours, but um, again, there's, there's been a lot of studies and, and not a big consensus on that. We'll also typically start all of our blocked cats on buprenorphine and prazosin. So prazosin being the alpha-1 antagonist, to try and release um, or relieve some uh, urethral spasms. We typically will wait on starting that until the patient has a normal blood pressure and ideally no longer azotemic. And then um, another thing to watch for, especially in the azotemic cats, so the really sick cats um, can get a pretty um, big post-obstructive diuresis. So in that case, we want to match the amount of fluids that we're giving them um, to the urine output. So sometimes that can result in pretty high fluid rates for these kitties. Um, but if we don't keep up with that, then their azotemia will worsen. So I've definitely seen that happen as well. For females, um, things can get a little trickier. Um, so the materials are pretty similar. You need your catheter. Most often we're going to be using a Foley catheter. Um, you could try a red rubber. I've never uh, placed a female red rubber urinary catheter, but um, if you have that and that's all you have, you can definitely try it. Um, sterile lidocaine jelly can be helpful in placing urethral catheters in females and then kind of everything you need to secure the catheter um, once you get it in place. So for these guys, you want to sedate the patient. Um, I would say most females will need sedation unless they're like obtunded or post-op or something like that. So the positioning of the patient kind of varies depending on the doctor preference or whoever's doing the procedure. So you can try lateral recumbency or you can try sternal recumbency with their legs hanging off the table. If one doesn't work, we'll usually try the other one. Um, you want to determine what length of catheter you need. Um, then you want to clip the hair from the vulva and flush the vulva and the vestibule with dilute chlorhexidine solution, usually about five times. And then instill sterile lidocaine jelly into the vestibule if you want. If you're using a speculum or an otoscope or anything like that to visualize, then you don't want to insert the jelly. I would say we usually don't do that, but certainly if you have it, um, it would uh, probably be helpful as long as you're not using one of those other things. Um, then you want to, you know, kind of prepare your sterile field, put your gloves on. Typically, I'll test my Foley, make sure the stylet works and can be taken out easily. The worst thing, um, or the, one of the more frustrating things is once you place the catheter, then you can't get the stylet out. So usually we'll take the whole stylet out and lubricate the whole stylet or at least flush the whole catheter through and make sure we can take the stylet out. And then you want to kind of, once you pick the catheter size you want, you want to mark the length that you um, want to go to so that you don't go too far. Because I've definitely seen catheters placed that fold back on themselves and come back out. So it's helpful to know kind of where you're aiming for. So once you've done all that, um, you kind of, again, like for male cats, lubricate the end of the catheter with sterile lube. Um, then you want to also have a gloved palpating finger. Um, so typically you want to do the palpating finger between the labia of the vulva. So depending on the size, um, you want to kind of see if you can palpate the urethral papilla. It's often very difficult to do that, especially if the patient is small. Um, and then you want to just try inserting your catheter ventral to your finger into the urethra and the bladder. Much easier said than done. So if you're not getting urine, um, you want to make sure you're in the right spot. You can withdraw your palpating finger um, once it, the catheter is in place without moving the catheter out, which sometimes can be difficult. And then once you know you're in the right spot, you can go ahead and inflate your Foley and then attach it to your closed system and take your x-rays just like you would for a male. So some tips and tricks for the female dog. Um, so these guys are hard to catheterize. We have a few nurses who are really good at it and some doctors who are really good at it, but it, it kind of takes time and practice and a lot of luck, really. Um, so you want to kind of line the catheter up along where the urethra should be. So if you just think about your anatomy, you, you want to aim the catheter tip downward. Um, if the patient is in 
like if you're right-handed, having the patient in right lateral recumbency may be more helpful. So you can use your right hand to palpate. Um, pulling the tail up can sometimes make the vulvar opening more narrow, so that can make it a little more difficult. And then there's some tips there on palpating as far as, you know, insert your finger vertically and then you want to aim it towards the spine and then change your position of the finger to horizontal just to kind of get your anatomy right. So there's all sorts of tips um, that you can read about. A lot of it, again, is just kind of practice and then luck as well. You can also use a speculum or an otoscope. Um, I've done this a few times. So if you are going to do that, again, don't put any sterile jelly in there. Um, if you are, are going to use this method, you're definitely going to need sedation. I would say most female dogs need sedation anyway. Um, so if you're using a speculum, you want the handles to point towards the spine, not downward. And for the otoscope cone, you can insert that um, directly into the vestibule and kind of visualize what you would try to be palpating. Um, so again, you know, this is going to be much more easy in a larger dog. For female cats and smaller female dogs, so in cats, the urethra kind of opens up on the floor of the vestibule and the little groove. Actually, I actually think it's easier to unblock a female cat than a female dog. Um, so you want to position in lateral recumbency or dorsal recumbency with the hind limbs cranially, kind of like for a male cat, although sometimes that's a little more difficult. Um, so those are some tips that might help with your smaller patients. Um, but again, yeah, it's a lot of practice and luck for the females. For a male dog, now we're getting into something that's much easier. So this, you know, typically will have the patient in lateral recumbency. Again, you want to decide the length that your catheter needs. Um, a lot of times you don't need to clip hair, but it, you know, if it's a very hairy dog, you may need to um, kind of prep the skin and the prepuce. And we'll usually flush the prepuce about three to five times with dilute chlorhexidine. Um, you want to have an assistant extrude the penis and kind of maintain it extruded until the catheter is placed. So you want to do this sterilely, obviously, with sterile gloves, um, and then kind of mark where your catheter should end, and then pass the catheter. Um, once you're in the correct spot, make sure, you know, based on where your mark was, insert the Foley and take your confirmation radiograph. So there's some pictures there of placing a male urinary catheter, uh, obviously a lot easier than the females. So once you have your catheter in place, and yet, let's say it is an indwelling catheter, um, you want to kind of inspect it at least a few times a day for any signs of soilage. You want to make sure your connections are secure. Um, you want to keep the collection bag lower than the patient to make sure that the urine flows retrograde. Seems like common sense, but sometimes I've seen a urine bag hanging at the eye level of the patient, so we want to make sure it's below the patient. Um, we'll typically empty and quantify the urine output every four to six hours or more frequently, depending on um, you know, how the patient's doing. Whenever you're quantifying urine, you wanna wear gloves. For azotemic patients, kind of like we mentioned earlier, we wanna match the fluid input to the output, because sometimes those fluid rates can be pretty high. Um, we'll typically do catheter maintenance about every eight to 12 hours. So we wear gloves and then we use surgical scrub and sterile saline to rinse the catheter insertion site, just to keep it clean. Um, sometimes they need to be cleaned more than that, but at least uh, we're inspecting that site every 8 to 12 hours. We'll talk about some gastric decompression techniques, the main one being GDV and how to relieve um, that gastric distension. So um, typically, you know, for GDV, the first things we're going to think of are stabilizing the patient hemodynamically. So two IV catheters in both cephalic veins. You want to give a shock dose of fluid, so typically 90 mils per kg would be the shock dose total per day. Um, you want to monitor the heart rate, uh, blood pressure, pulse quality, things like that. For um, your gastric decompression, definitely want to get some pain medications on board. So a pure mu opioid would be preferred, so we typically will do hydro. Uh, also an antiemetic, because usually these patients are retching, so serenia. On dancitron, either one of those. 
Um, we'll also do a pre-medication with lidocaine to reduce reperfusion injury. Um, so we'll usually do a two mig per kg bolus followed by a CRI, um, usually for about the first 24 hours. And that's been found to have uh, show a lower incidence of arrhythmias, acute kidney injury, and less time in the hospital. So there's a couple different things that you could do. The preferred method would be oral gastric intubation. I would say we don't do that very commonly anymore. Usually we're just trocharizing because our surgeons are pretty readily available and we can get the patient in the OR quickly. If you couldn't get the patient into the OR quickly, then definitely the oral gastric intubation would be preferred. Um, if you can't do that, like if you don't want to fully anesthetize the patient, you can try passing a nasogastric tube. Sometimes that will be helpful if it's just a bunch of air, if it's a lot of flu fluid or um, things like that, maybe, but if it's food, the nasogastric intubation is not going to be helpful, but we'll talk about that, how to do that as well. So your orogastric intubation, this is where you insert um, an orogastric tube through the mouth down into the stomach. So um, the most common indication for this would be GDB, um, but you could also do this, and sometimes poison control might recommend it to remove ingested toxins or to give medications, something like that. A uh, reason you might not want to do this would be if the patient is in respiratory distress and some complications. Um, you can certainly cause damage to the esophagus or the gastric wall. We can um, see regurgitation or aspiration of gastric contents. Um, so for that reason, we don't recommend doing this unless the patient is anesthetized and intubated with an endotracheal tube as well. So you're going to need an oral gastric tube and various size depending on uh, how big your patient is and then you want to have a marker so you can determine the length of the tube so this is a good picture of kind of where you want to go so this would be kind of the end of the stomach so he's going to put his marker like right here um, you want lubricant and then you want your bucket to put all the gastric contents in so again like we talked about you want the patient to be under general anesthesia ideally intubated and that's going to be to reduce the risk of aspiration because if you are successful in getting the tube in the stomach and all those contents come up there's a high risk that they're going to aspirate unless their airway is protected um, typically we'll start with the patient's internal recumbency with their head elevated sometimes we'll kind of put their front legs off of the front of the table with their head elevated if we're having a hard time but Definitely sternal recumbency would be preferred. Um, again, you want to measure your tube length. Um, a mouth gag is helpful, or if you don't have that, just a two-inch tape roll to hold the mouth open. You want to lubricate the end of the tube and use a soft tip to push the tube into the esophagus. If you're getting any sort of resistance, um, you can kind of twist the tube and kind of try different directions, um, but basically you want to try to get it through the cardia of the stomach. You could have an assistant blow into the tube gently as it's advanced. Sometimes that's helpful. And then once you're in the esophagus or stomach, um, fluid will pass out of the tube into the collection container. If you're not getting any fluid, you can try doing um, warm water. So instilling that into the stomach using the funnel and a pump and then massaging the belly and then lower the head and neck to allow this stuff to drain out. Um, once you um, or in the stomach, you can kind of pull the tube in and out of the mouth to create like a siphon effect. Um, and that can sometimes help the ingesta flow better. Um, and then you kind of want to just repeat this procedure several times until your lavage fluid runs clear. Once you're done, you want to remove the tube so you kink it and then pull it all the way out. So the next uh, method for gastric decompression would be trocharization. Um, so this is going to decrease the time to gastric decompression. So a lot of times we'll trocharize before we'll try an oral gastric intubation or we'll trocharize before we get into the OR. So um, for this, really you just need some clippers, surgical scrub, an over the needle catheter and sterile gloves. Really the complications for this procedure are pretty minimal. Um, you could in theory perforate the stomach. That's a pretty small risk. You could lacerate the spleen um, if it's up near the stomach, but in general, this is a pretty safe procedure. So we start with a patient in right lateral recumbency or sternal recumbency. Um, you can also kind of just 
blot the abdomen and figure out where the tympanic area is. Um, it's usually going to be on the left side, um, kind of caudal to the last rib, but you'll see the distended stomach. And if you ping it, it'll, um, you know, sound like air. So you kind of clip and prep that area, put your sterile gloves on, and then search your catheter through the abdominal wall and into the stomach. Um, once you hear gas flow, which is like a hissing sound, um, or if you start seeing gastric fluid in the hub of your catheter, um, then you want to advance the catheter off the stylet. And I usually remove the stylet and just leave the catheter in there until you're no longer hearing the hissing sound. Usually smells pretty foul. You can kind of um, push your hand on the stomach to kind of push it down until it becomes more flaccid or noticeably reduced in size. So once you've done that, you can remove the catheter. Depending on how long it takes your surgeon to get there, you may need to do this several more times, but it is a pretty quick way to just to get some of that air out of there and help stabilize the patient um, pretty quickly. For nasogastric intubation, that's going to be where you place the tube through the nasal cavity down into the stomach. So um, this would be helpful for patients that are uncomfortable due to gastric dilation. Um, Again, due to air, mostly some fluid, but not if it's like a food bloat or something like that. A nasogastric tube is not going to be helpful. Um, if you have a GBV patient and you can't um, place an orogastric tube, then this could be um, an alternative. It's something much quicker to do. They don't have to be fully anesthetized, so it's something to consider. Some contraindications would be respiratory distress, food bloat, cats with aerophasia coagulopathy, or thrombocytopenia. So the materials needed, you definitely need your nasogastric tube. Um, so we use the Mila ones, you can use a red rubber. The topical prepare cane, just like we talked about for the nasal oxygen catheters, we install that into the nose um, to numb it up. Sterile lube, gloves, suture, um, e-collar, and then your syringe and everything that you're gonna need to suction the tube. Sedation as needed. Most of the time, these patients will need some sedation unless they're severely compromised. So this chart just kind of shows kind of the, the size guide. So again, kind of for the nasal oxygen catheters, this is just a guide. So we're looking at um, you know, six, eight, 10 French, uh, depending on the size of the patient. So for this procedure, you're gonna put on your gloves and then drop the prepare cane into the nostrils to numb it up, and then you want to measure the nasogastric tube from the nasal meatus to the level of the last rib, and then mark it with a permanent marker, and then also measure to the thoracic inlet. Um, you want to remove the stylet from the tube, lubricate it up, or um, flush it with sterile saline just to make sure you can get the tube out of there, um, and then you want to grab the muzzle and insert the tube ventrally and medial into the nose um, and then push the nose upwards um, can help kind of make it easier. So there's a couple of different ways you can kind of finagle the, with your assistant and the positioning of the patient to make it go um, into the esophagus as opposed to the trachea. Uh, so once you get the tube into the nostril, um, you want to point the patient's nose ventrally um, so to close off the thoracic inlet so that it goes into the esophagus and then you want to pass the tube to the first number at which the tube will terminate at the thoracic inlet and then you take a confirmation x-ray make sure that the placement is correct so we want to make sure we're in the esophagus and not the trachea and then continue advancing it into the pre-measured length. Um, so once you're in the stomach you take another film make sure it looks good you're in the stomach and then remove the stylet and secure the tube to the nose. Similar to how we secure the nasal oxygen catheters, usually go lateral to the nostril. Um, a lot of times I'll do a needle um, down, like facing down, not up towards the eye, and then feed suture through the needle and kind of do a little stay suture there, and then a finger trap. Um, you can also do some additional sutures or staples along the side of the face, just so it's extra secure. Once the tube's in place and you've confirmed you're in the stomach, you wanna aspirate fluid or air, and then be sure and you know notate how much you got out, and then place, place an e-collar 
um, again, because their patient's going to paw at that and try and get that out. So this is a picture of the confirmation x-rays that we would take. So it's in the esophagus here, so dorsal to the trachea. Um, if we just looked at the x-ray here, it's hard to tell if it's in the esophagus or the trachea, and then here it's ending in the stomach. Um, when we developed the protocol that I just read to you guys, uh, we did that because we did have a nasogastric tube that went into the trachea, and then on, we just took a picture here, and it looked like it was in the right spot, but it actually had gone through a bronchus, so that obviously was not very good for the patient. So we added that additional step where we'll take the x-ray to confirm it's in the esophagus at the thoracic inlet and then proceed forward, and I think that's really helped, especially for, you know, we have our nurses play C sometimes, so that the newer nurses in training and um, just, I think it's a lot safer, so that's why we do the two x-rays. So some complications of nasogastric tube placement. Um, you can definitely have placement into the trachea or the bronchi, like I just mentioned. Um, you can have epistaxis, hemorrhage, dislodgement. Um, the tube can clog. They can get aspiration pneumonia or esophageal stricture. So this x-ray here just shows this tube was actually in the bronchus. So um, if you just looked here, it may look okay. Here it kind of looks okay, but here you can tell it's in the trachea. So once the nasogastric tube is in place, it can remain in place for up to seven days. We typically will aspirate the tube about every four to six hours or more frequently if needed. Um, if a patient is regurgitating and you're not getting any um, fluid off of the nasogastric tube, um, definitely recheck an x-ray and see if the tube is still in the stomach. A lot of times it will migrate out. Um, so that could be one thing to check for. We can also give medications to the nasogastric tube, so liquid medications. Uh, we also do tube feedings to the nasogastric tube, so you can give a CRI or a bolus. So um, they're pretty um, widespread usage in our hospital, I would say. Uh, we place a lot of nasogastric tubes. And then uh, you wanna be sure and flush the tube with six to 10 mils of water anytime that a medication or a food is given to prevent clogging. So this is just some pictures of a gastric lavage. So similar to GDVs, but this would be more for like intoxications. Um, but here we just have the two buckets. So there's gastric contents. And then here he's got his pump. So he's pumping in the warm water. Um, so kind of going back and forth between those buckets there. Um, so typically if you need to do gastric lavage for an intoxication, um, it's best if it happens within one to two hours of the time that the patient ingested the toxin. Um, and it's usually only reached for, so they'll only recommend gastric lavage if there's a reason that the patient shouldn't vomit. So depending on whether it's some toxin that we don't want to be emitted through the vomit, like some of your um, gases, like your toxic gases, things like that, or if the patient itself, like vomiting would be contraindicated, but the patient's very clinical. Sometimes poison control will recommend a gastric lavage. Um, some contraindications to doing this would be if there's food bloat, um, if they ingested something caustic or volatile, if they ingested a small number of tablets or capsules, it's unlikely to be effective. Complications would be things like aspiration or trauma to the GI tract. So this is gonna be similar to placing the orogastric tube as we talked about earlier for GDVs. Um, but basically once you get your tube in place, which obviously should be easier to pass if the stomach isn't tours, so these cases are a lot easier to learn on, then you instill room temperature water to lavage the stomach um, by use of a siphon or a stomach pump. And then once you instill the water, you allow it to kind of passively drain and then you can kind of blot the abdomen to get all that fluid out of there. And again, you wanna repeat until the fluid runs clear. And then once you're ready to pull the tube, you wanna kink it before you pull it out. I believe this is the last procedure that I have, um, which is placing an intraosseous catheter. So this is gonna be for your neonates um, or patients that have really poor veins and you need venous access right away. Um, placing an IO catheter is helpful. Um, so if a patient's really dehydrated, really small, if you can't access their veins, 
um, or if they're in such severe shock, you can't get a vein. Um, you can definitely try placing an intraosseous catheter. They're usually pretty quick to place. Um, there's minimal complications. You can get fluids that way, and they're usually pretty cheap. Some contraindications would be if there's a fracture in the bone, obviously you don't want to place a catheter in there if they've had like a previous orthopedic procedure done. If there's an infection, like if you shave the area and it looks infected, don't insert a catheter there. Pneumatic bone, so obviously not in birds, uh, or metabol metabolic bone disease. Um, you wouldn't want to place a catheter in those cases either. So you can perform this using just a traditional catheter or uh, there is a catheter gun called the Easy IO, um, which uh, is helpful. It kind of helps just, it's like a little drill. So you drill through the bone and it allows easy placement of the catheter. So the most common locations will be the trochanteric fossa of the femur. Um, you can also use the proximal humerus, the tibial tuberosity, or the wing of the ilium. So the materials you want to have for this would be clippers, scrub, lidocaine local block, um, your T-port, suture material, and then whatever sort of needle you're going to use. Um, if you're using just regular old needles, a 22 gauge, three quarter or half inch long, or a spinal needle for smaller patients, and neonates, um, or the, if you're using the e easy IO catheter gun, they have their own needles as well. If it's a bigger dog, the bone marrow needles um, are good for kind of getting patients with more ossified bones. For the femur, you want to clip the area around the femur, usually about two to two and a half inches um, around the insertion site. Prep the area, put your gloves on. Um, we'll do a small amount of lidocaine um, kind of to the level of the periosteum. And then um, once you are kind of prepped and everything, you want to place your finger on the long axis of the bone where the catheter will be placed. And then you kind of want to adduct the limb slightly, so towards ventral midline, and then rotate the trochanteric fossa laterally so that you avoid the sciatic nerve. And then once you're kind of in that position, you insert the catheter lengthwise into the medulla of the femur, uh, kind of parallel to the finger and alongside the bone. So you're going to kind of aim for that trochanteric fossa. And then um, we'll usually kind of push and twist the needle in a single line. So it does require some, a little bit of force, not a whole lot, unless you're using that catheter gun and it drills it for you. So once you have the needle in place, you kind of push the hub of the needle back and forth, moving the limb. So the hub of the needle should be um, seated well into the bone so that when you move the hub of the needle, the legs should move too. So they should move together. Um, once you think you're in the right spot, aspirate the needle or the catheter. If you get bone marrow, that confirms you're in the right spot. Um, you should also take a confirmation x-ray, so the needle should be perfectly lined up with the bone. Um, you can also flush a small amount of saline. If you're um, getting any sort of resistance, you're probably not in the right spot, so it should flush pretty easily. Um, and then you want to also make sure the tissue around the catheter is not leaking. So if you do see that there's fluid leakage, um, you may need to try another bone. Once the catheter is in spot or in the right spot, you attach your T-port and then you kind of anchor it in, which I always find to be the hardest part to kind of securing this in place. So there's a couple of different ways you can kind of finagle it. Um, sometimes we'll use butterfly tape and a staple to suture the T-port around. Um, usually these patients aren't moving around very much and the catheters don't stay in very long anyway, but um, we have lost a few catheters due to poor taping in, usually on my behalf. So this is a picture of the catheter gun. So it's got variously sized um, needles here and it comes with a little T-port. So it's pretty fun to use. Um, some complications of placing IO catheters, they can become dislodged. You can get fluid um, kind of leaking out of the catheter. You can see infections or osteomyelitis. Sometimes it's painful. Rarely would you have a fracture at the bone site, but it, it's certainly possible. Once the catheter is in place, like I mentioned, they usually only last for a short period, so three to four hours. 
Um, and, and most of the time, you're, you know, once the patient's better hydrated, you can get venous access at that time. Um, so whenever you're handling the catheter, you want to make sure you wear gloves and your hands are clean, things like that. And then uh, we typically flush the catheter about every six hours with saline. Um, and even if it is working well, you don't want to leave it in place for over 96 hours. Um, so definitely try and find the different venous access point at that time. So those are just some of the references I used for this presentation. For a certificate of attendance, uh, send an email to Becky. Uh, so it's bdan at Nashville Vet Specialist with an S on the end, .com. That's all I have for you guys. So if you have any specific questions for me or if something comes up, feel free to call MVS. Um, you know, if I'm not there, one of the other ER doctors is happy to help.